Thank you, Mark. Good morning. We're in the book of Romans, and we're in Romans chapter 7. We're going to finish that chapter this morning, beginning with verse 14 through verse 25. Great text on the spiritual life and the struggle of it. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of flesh, sold into bondage to sin. For what I am doing, I do not understand, for I am not practicing what I would like to do, but am doing the very thing I hate. But if I do the very thing I do not want to do, I agree with the law, confessing that the law is good. So now, no longer am I the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For the willing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. For the good that I want, I do not do, but I practice the very evil that I do not want. But if I am doing the very thing I do not want, I am no longer the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. I find then the principle that evil is present in me, the one who wants to do good. For I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man, but I see a different law in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin, which is in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, on the one hand, I myself with my mind am serving the law of God, but on the other, with my flesh, the law of sin. May the Lord bless this reading of his word and bless our time of study together. Let's bow in a word of prayer. In his classic novel, All Quiet on the Western Front, Eric Maria Remarque gave a grim account of the First World War through the lives of some German students who volunteered for the army. Looking back on it, the leading character said, no one had the vaguest idea what we were in for. Some of them, he said, were beside themselves with joy. The excitement was soon replaced with the reality of life in the trenches, with the mud, the rats, the heavy bombardments, and the hand-to-hand conflict in no man's land. A soldier needs to know what he's up against. He needs realism when he goes to war so that he's not disillusioned and his resolve to fight doesn't collapse with the first casualties. Well, that's true for the Christian life as well. The Christian life is not one of easy progress and joy. It's a war. And we need to know that and we need to understand the very nature of it. War is something described, sometimes described as long periods of boredom punctuated by short moments of excitement. Not our war. It is constant. The classic passage on the spiritual war is our text this morning, Romans chapter 7, verses 14 through 25, where Paul describes the inner struggle between our new nature and our old one, between the new man and sin. The war is relentless. It is mortal combat fraught with frustration and failure. So much so that Paul finally cries out, wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of death? The intensity of that cry gives a a sense of the intensity of the struggle. It is great. But not all see this passage in that light. Some question that a Christian could call himself a wretched man who needs to be freed, not after chapter 6 where Paul said we are freed from the law. 
So, for example, when Paul describes himself in verse 14 as sold into bondage to sin, he could not be describing himself as a regenerate man. He must be unregenerate. After all, how could a man who was born again say what Paul says in verse 18, nothing good dwells in me? That doesn't fit the, the character and the life of a new creation in Christ. So some have taken these verses to be descriptive of Paul as a non-believer whose condition is not resolved until verse 25 when he declares, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now that was the view of many of the early church fathers and later of the Arminians that Paul was describing his pre-conversion struggle with the law. Jacob Arminius, in fact, wrote over 200 pages defending this view. A more modern variation of this view is that Paul is not so much describing his own experience as an unregenerate man, uh, but that of the, uh, the, the Jewish people under the law. So when Paul uses the word I, he's not really speaking of himself. He's not speaking personally, but representatively or maybe rhetorically and putting himself in the shoes of Jewish people. The obvious objection to that is it's not the natural way to read the text. Why should we suspect that uh, Paul is not really speaking of himself, but speaking of Israel when he says I? But whether a person argues that Paul is speaking of himself or speaking representatively for others, this really does not fit spiritual reality. The unbeliever is self-righteous. He does not recognize that he's a wretched man. Paul's own testimony gives support to that fact. And you read in Philippians chapter 3, his assessment of himself when he was a Pharisee, before he had come to faith in Jesus Christ, he said that he was found blameless before the law, not a wretched man. The reality is that the more we advance spiritually, the more clearly we see God's standards and his righteousness, and the more deeply we regret our shortcomings. And that's a sign of regeneration. Oh, wretched man that I am is a sign of the new birth. Many people have experienced more soul trials after their conversion than before when they had no sense of their lost condition, no real conviction of their guilt. So to the contrary, there are good reasons for interpreting Paul's words in verses 14 and uh, 20, all the way through verse 25, this whole uh, passage as his own words spoken of his own experience as a regenerate man, as a born-again saint. The first is they fit reality. Paul is struggling against sin. He recognizes his inability to live obediently and hates his failure to do it. The unregenerate man doesn't have that attitude. The unregenerate man doesn't hate his failure to keep the law. Secondly, in verses 16 and 22, Paul states that he delights in the law. He calls it good. That's not true of an unregenerate person. The non-Christian is against God's law. In just a few verses, in chapter 8 and verse 7, Paul states that the unconverted mind is hostile toward God and does not subject itself to the law of God. But here in the second half of Romans 7, Paul says, I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man. Thirdly, the, the change in tense favors the view that Paul is a regenerate man. So we bring grammar into the discussion and it weighs favorably in view of Paul being born again in this second half of the chapter. In the first half of the chapter, Paul describes his pre-Christian pre life 
and, and writes all of that in the past tense. In verse 9 he wrote, I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin became alive and I died. That's all in the past tense. In the second half of the chapter, his description uh, of himself is in the present tense. I am doing the very thing I hate. Verse 15, verse 21, I find then the principle that evil is present in me. Present tense. Paul's use of the first person I and my and his use of the present tense clearly indicates that he has moved in his description from his former life to his present life. All of this indicates that Paul was describing his feelings at the time of writing. At the time he was putting all this down, he was explaining his present experience. That he's describing that his Christian life is like this. Your Christian life is like this. And fourthly, that fits the flow of the argument of the book. Paul has moved from justification in chapters 3 through 5 to sanctification, the Christian life in chapters 6 through 8. Returning to justification doesn't make good sense. Paul has stated clearly that the law cannot save, that the law cannot justify the sinner. He's developed that thoroughly. But neither can the law sanctify the saint. The law cannot clean up our lives. The problem isn't the law. The law is good. It's God's revelation. The problem is in us. We lack the personal strength to keep the law, to do it. That's what Paul says. Now, Paul said in verse 4 that believers are no longer under the law. We died to the law. But that doesn't mean that the law is useless. It is an expression of God's holiness. Paul loved the law. He loved the scriptures. He learned from them as we do. But he fell short of them. He fell short of the righteous standard that is in the Word of God. He couldn't live up to the law standard. That's the struggle that he describes here. We have died to sin. It is not the controlling force of our lives. He's made that clear. But sin is still in our lives. It's in our minds. It will be as long as we are in this world, as long as we are in the flesh. We fight it, but it is strong. That's the Christian life. So here in chapter 7, Paul explains the agony of resisting sin and the futility so often of our struggle to obey God in our own strength. We are frustrated by sin. That's the war within. Paul describes it in uh, th three different times here in verses 14 through 17, uh, verses 18 through 20, and then in verses 21 through 24. He ends with hope, but also with the resolve to continue the struggle. The, the Christian life is lived in the trenches. Paul begins by acknowledging his weakness in the conflict. In contrast to the law, which is spiritual, he's unspiritual. I am of flesh, he says, enslaved to the power he opposes. That's the problem we all have, our flesh, which is not the body itself. We shouldn't understand this as condemning the physical aspects of ourselves and of the world. It's not that. It's not our physical makeup. It is the body controlled by sin. It is the anti-God influence within us, and it's in all of us. F.F. F. Bruce wrote of this, there is something in man, even regenerate man, which objects to God and seeks to be independent of Him. Even in our, our new 
life, even as born-again individuals, there is something within us, as Bruce says, that still resists God's will in our lives. Well, that something is sin, which Paul says in verse 17, dwells in me. Not just is present in me, but it dwells. It has a kind of life and vigor. It is active within us. And the law can't rein it in, can't control that. The law is good, but the law is weak. It can define sin, it can expose sin, but it cannot remove sin. It cannot make us obedient. And so our efforts, the best of them, are met with failure. Well, that is the struggle. Uh, Paul gives his, his first descript, description of it in verse 15. It is perplexing, he says. I do not understand what I'm doing. And it is frustrating. He delights in righteousness. He wants to do it. But he does the opposite. I'm doing the very thing I hate, he says. That's the, the terrible conflict that the Christian has. But it's, it's that struggle, in that very struggle, that we see our true self. It brings it out through the struggle. That's what Paul says of himself in verses 16 and 17. He agrees with the law. It is good, he says. And he hates sin. He fights against it. That's the, that's the real Paul, the new creation. The culprit is sin. And Paul distinguishes himself from it in verse 17 where he says, No longer am I the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. Well, Paul personified sin in verses 8 and 9. He described it as alive. Uh, it was, uh, it's like a snake that the law provokes that the law uh, rouses up to strike. Well, that's how the, the picture he gave in the previous passage. Here he describes the law of rather sin as a, an unwanted guest, as a, a squatter living within him, and he can't get rid of it. Sin is in us, and its desires are active. It can't kill us, but it urges us and it pulls us to go a different way than the way we should go, it, which is completely out of character for us as new creatures in Christ. And yet, so often, sin wins. Paul confirms that in verse 18 where he explains his condition further. Nothing good dwells in me. Now he qualifies that. He says, in my flesh. As a Christian, Paul was a new creation. But his flesh, what, what remained of the old life, is not good. He's not describing himself here as two people. He speaks of I and me, not, not two eyes or two me's. It's one person. But he has two sides to himself now. And, and the flesh, the, the sin nature, is a, a very significant part of his life. Uh, we're like a prisoner, as uh, William G.T. Shedd put it, who has been freed. The, the chains that bound him have been broken, but heavy fragments remain and, and are dragged along and slow the man's movement. Well, the flesh does that. For, Paul says, the willing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. That is Paul's second description of the struggle. We, we contradict ourselves. He completes the description in verses 19 and 20 by saying he, he knows the good. He wants to do it. But he says, I practice the very evil that I do not want. 
He is a man divided against himself. Martin Luther likened our condition to a horse and its rider. They are both one in a sense. They ride together, but sometimes the horse doesn't trot exactly as the rider wishes. I can sympathize with that. I was never much of a horseman. Whenever I got on a horse, it did just the opposite of what I wanted it to do. It would not go when I wanted it to and not stop when I needed it to. And I often found myself on the ground. Well, the illustration, I think, is valid, but it doesn't go all the way as we would like. Uh, we can blame a horse for being a bad horse, but uh, Paul's not doing that. He's not denying responsibility for the sin he committed by blaming the flesh or uh, blaming sin in order to exonerate himself. It's his flesh. And the sin that frustrates his will to do good dwells in him. At the end, in verse 25, Paul identifies himself as the agent, as the, the person who serves both God and sin. It's his sin. He does it. He spoke about this last week. He personifies sin. He speaks of it as though it's this kind of entity separate from him, uh, like a, a serpent within us or like uh, a squatter within his house, his, his life. But sin is what he does. Sin is not something separate. It's what we do in our thoughts, in our actions. And what he's saying is it's powerful within him. Uh, and so he has this great struggle. He's doing it. He's guilty. He's saying that. And, and recognizing that sin is completely inconsistent with the man he is in Christ. That person is, is the one who wills to do good. That's Paul's great desire, but the reality is he can never completely do that. Now, isn't that your experience? Some of those who say this is Paul in his unregenerate state or he's speaking of unregenerate people, I want to ask them, you don't have this experience? We all have that experience. This is so typical. You want to please God as a child of God, but you find that you don't obey, not fully. That is what Paul discovered about himself. So he concludes that, that there's nothing good in him. That's how pervasive sin is. It, it's so, it, it is so deeply entrenched in him that it has affected everything. Even the good that he does is unsatisfactory because, because it's been tainted by sin. An old Anglican bishop, Bishop Beveridge, put this rather well, I think. He, he wrote, I, I cannot pray but I sin. My repentance needs to be repented of. My tears want washing. The very, and the very washing of my tears needs still to be washed over again with the blood of the Redeemer. I repent of the very tears of my repentance is what he's saying. The best that we do is not the best it could be. It's never perfect. It's stained, as it were. It all seems pretty dismal as you look at this. He is sold into, bond, into bondage to sin, and nothing good dwells in him. Now, we should say Romans 7, verses 14 through 25, isn't the whole story of the Christian life. In chapter 6, Paul said that we are dead to sin. We are free from it. We have victories. We progress and we mature in the faith. Paul teaches that in chapter 8, the, the chapter on the Holy Spirit. That's the source of our victory. It's from Christ through the Holy Spirit. In our strength, we fall to sin, always. What the Christian learns is the more mature that he or she becomes, 
the more we grow in the faith, we learn just how strong sin is. Just how prone we are to yield to it. And just how much we need to depend upon Jesus Christ. Eventually, we will triumph. Paul says that in verse 25. But, but that is still future. In the present, we are in a war. And it, it, it is vital that we know that, that we have realism about that. That things uh, that, that are uh, going on in our lives are recognized for what they are. We need to see things as they are. Paul clearly thought that was important. He, he describes the struggle of the Christian life, the struggle he was in, the struggle that you and I are in continually. He describes that struggle three times in this passage. So that's quite an emphasis to put on it. And he doesn't tone it down or he doesn't mince his words. He describes it all plainly. We are a living contradiction. We don't do what we should do. We do what we shouldn't do. And Paul continues to explain that failure in verses 21 through 24, <clears throat> where he gives his third description of the struggle. There are two laws within us, and they are at war with each other. The law of God in the inner man, in his inner being, his regenerated true self, and it operates in his mind, which has been renewed, which has been regenerated. And, and it approves God's law. It rejoices in God's law. But the law of sin is in the members of his body. Now, again, the body, the material part of man isn't, isn't sin. But sin influences it. It influences the members of our body, the uh, our eyes, our tongue, our hands, our feet, they're all made instruments of evil. And Paul fights against that with the law of his mind, but the law in his members is too strong and makes him a prisoner, he says. He gains control and he does the very thing that he does not want to do. Now that's the struggle. It is hard. Paul's reach exceeds his grasp. It is unattainable. He reaches for obedience, but he's unable to attain it. Frustration is his continual experience, and it is a bitter experience for the apostle. The deep disappointment he feels comes out in verse 24 when he cries, wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death? What Christian at some time has not said that in his or her heart? Oh, wretched man that I am. Or, or felt the shame that Peter felt when he said, go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. David confessed his sins all through the Psalms. When Isaiah saw the Lord lofty and lifted up and glorified in the, in the temple, he said, Woe is me, for I am ruined, because I am a man of unclean lips. Who says I'm worthy? Not the Christian. In fact, Charles Cranfield wrote, The more serious a Christian strives to live from grace and to submit to the discipline of the gospel, the more sensitive he becomes to his sinfulness. Well, that was Paul's experience. Not, it's not the cry of an unbeliever. An unbeliever doesn't have that depth of understanding. This is a believer struggling with himself and his sin. Charles Spurgeon understood that from a very early age. He was saved at the age of 15 in a small primitive Methodist church. You're all familiar with the story of his conversion. Um, I think we've talked, I've talked about it a number of times. Uh, the great Calvinist was led to Christ by a simple Arminian. 
And naturally, Spurgeon was drawn back to the place, to that, that place where he was brought to saving knowledge of Christ on the next week, the next Sunday. But during that week, in between the Sunday when he was saved and the Sunday that he returned, uh, he had what he called many experiments and tumbled down a great many times. In other words, he, he fell into sin a number of times during that week. And so when he came to church that second Sunday, he was glad to see that the preacher had taken as his text, O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thought, yes, I know all about that. That is my case. But when the preacher said that Paul was not a Christian when he wrote those words, Spurgeon said, I never went there again. Though I was only seven days old in divine things, I knew better than that. I knew that no man but a Christian ever could or would cry out against sin with that bitter wail. Now that's the cry of a sensitive conscience. It sorrows over sin. It is deeply disturbed by spiritual defeat. And very often that is lacking, I must say, with our easygoing evangelicalism today. Not with Paul. The fight was serious business. But it was not one that he could win in his own strength. Even with his new nature, with his new mind, with his love for the law of God. He could not win that battle. And so he cries out, who will set me free from the body of this death? This, this physical body with its natural desires which is, is, is captured by sin for its deadly practices. Who will deliver me? Now that is a cry of anguish, but not a cry of despair. Because immediately he answers his own question with confidence, with hope. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Christ will set us free. He will deliver this body in the resurrection to come so that it will be glorified, it will be perfect, it will be controlled by righteousness, not by sin. Oh, well, that's our future. That's our hope. And the assurance that it gives is a final victory when we are delivered not only from the penalty of sin, we're delivered from that now, and not only from the power of sin, the power of sin's been broken, it's still with us as Paul has demonstrated, but the power has been broken. But we'll not only be delivered completely from that, those, we will be delivered from the very presence of sin. It will be no more. The struggle will be over. And that's our hope. But that's the future. In the meantime, we continue the struggle. And so Paul concludes by summarizing the spiritual conflict. So then, he writes, On the one hand, I myself with my mind am serving the law of God, but on the other with my flesh the law of sin. But he does that with hope. And that hope instills confidence and determination to fight the war within because he knows that he is promised final victory. We shall prevail. And that gives incentive. The knowledge of victory and the certainty of it gives us incentive to fight on. But again, the fight is hard. I read a book about a sad conversation that uh, minister Ron Sitlow recounted, recounted in a book that he co-authored titled Compassion Without Compromise. It's a book about very contemporary moral issues that we are facing in the evangelical church. A young man came to him on a Sunday morning to speak very briefly with him. He didn't want to have a long conversation with his minister. He wanted to be brief. He'd been a member of the congregation for some time, but he had struggled with a particular sin. 
And yet he had come to uh, a point where he decided that he was going to make peace with his sin. What the minister said was significant. No more struggle, no more questions. He tried to reason with the young man. I sought to keep the conversation going, but he was done. His heart was hardened, and he soon changed churches. No more struggle. That is a strong temptation, particularly when we deal with a besetting sin, one that is particularly troublesome in our life. No more struggle. Quit the fight. But a Christian cannot do that. Paul has written this chapter to give us a realistic understanding of the Christian life. It is not an easy progress to the end. It is a struggle, a hard one, with failure and frustration. All of us fail and are frustrated daily. There, there is no victory in our own strength and determination. We may, we may resolve to do something and find that we fail again. That success that we would enjoy and that we do enjoy comes only through the power of the Holy Spirit. And He gives that. He does give that. Ultimately, that victory is at the end as Paul indicates here. In the meantime, we struggle on. And the confidence of ultimate victory and the confidence that we can gain as we understand the power of the Spirit and the victory that comes by walking by the Spirit should give us the incentive to fight on and continue the struggle. We do that by faith. <clears throat> Like the priests of Israel who carried the Ark of the Covenant across the Jordan River. It had flooded. It was impassable. But Israel was to cross the Jordan into Canaan. It's in Joshua chapter 3. The priests didn't command the people to begin to gather wood and build a bridge across the Jordan. They didn't say, let's make boats and float across it. What the priests did was to pick up the Ark of the Covenant and walk into the flood. But when they did that, when the soles of their feet touched the water, the river stopped and backed up, and the priests stood firm on dry ground while the people crossed. That is walking by faith. It's going forward against the obstacles, against the enemy, as it were, against all that's against us. It is believing God's Word. It is going forward in the power of the Spirit, and God blesses. The struggle is hard. It has failures. But thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, we shall prevail. Well, let me end with a quote from John Newton. Newton you know, was a slave trader who became a preacher of the gospel and wrote hymns, most famously, Amazing Grace. He estimated that he transported 20,000 slaves across the Atlantic. He said that in his nightmares, he could still hear their screams. But he was converted, and he was changed. In his later years, he said, I am not what I ought to be. Ah, oh, how imperfect and deficient. I am not what I wish to be. I am not what I hope to be. Yet, though I am not what I ought to be, nor what I wish to be, nor what I hope to be, I can truly say I am not what I once was, a slave to sin and Satan. And I can heartily join with the Apostle and acknowledge, by the grace of God, I am what I am. Have you experienced God's grace? He saves all who believe in Jesus Christ. He's the only Savior. And all who trust in Him, and that's all one must do. See, stop seeking to obtain God's favor by your good works or... Stop, seek, stop being indifferent to the things of God. 
recognize that you're a sinner in need of a Savior and come to Him and He receives all who do. And those who do receive at that moment complete forgiveness of sin, life everlasting, and the will to fight. The will to wage the war that's a spiritual war within all of us. So if you haven't believed, come to Him, trust in Him, and by His grace and power live for Him. May we all do that. Let's pray. Father, we do thank You for Your goodness. We thank You for Your grace. We could not do anything apart from that. By the grace of God, I am what I am. And by that grace and that grace alone. We thank You for the gift of life that's in Your Son. We thank You for sending Him into the world to die for sinners, of which we all are. We thank You for the grace that brought us to a saving knowledge of Him. It's in His name we pray. Amen.